Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Distributed SQL Summit, the Cloud Native panel. Uh, we have an exciting panel lined up here with uh, folks representing different portions of the Cloud Native stack. So this is going to be really, really exciting. So maybe to kick it off, let's just get a, a round of intros, right? Like, uh, so I'm just going to go down my screen and ask folks to introduce themselves, like you know your, yourselves and, and, the, and the company right, that, that you belong to. Um, Abby, maybe we'll start with you. Thank you for having me first. Uh, I'm Abby Kearns. I am the CTO at Puppet. Puppet does infrastructure automation. We've been around since the beginning of the DevOps phase and continue to be part of the, the movement as it moves more broadly into DevSecOps as well. Thanks, Karthik, and thanks uh, for having me over. Um, I'm JJ, uh, co-founder Tetrate. So um, we are into um, Istio, Service Mesh, the layer above uh, cloud to basically connect applications and APIs and infrastructure together, uh, infrastructure APIs together. Um, so we sort of become like the runtime uh, after everything is done to make sure like we actually get stuff done uh, in, uh, in production. So that's, that's mostly what we do. Uh, I'm Tamek. I'm the CEO co-founder at uh, Hasro. Um, Hasra is a data access infrastructure company. Our aim is to kind of simplify challenges with uh, for application developers that they face when they kind of need to do data access in a cloud native polyglot data kind of environment. Um, and uh, we deliver this over uh, a GraphQL API. Um, and so that's kind of been you know really exciting for developers. But uh, glad to be here. I'm excited for the conversation ahead. Awesome. Thanks, Tan Mike. And uh, I'll go last, I'll introduce myself. Hey folks, I'm Karthik, I'm the CTO and co-founder at uh, Yugabyte. We build a cloud native database, uh, a distributed SQL database. So think your traditional Postgres SQL database that everybody loves and uses, but you know, applied to a cloud native world, right? So solving problems such as uh, making it uh, continuously available irrespective of failures or upgrades, giving you the ability to scale the database and replicate data as a first class citizen inside the database, right? As, as opposed to something you deal with externally. So in the, in the overall scheme of things, deal with the data layer of this cloud native uh, stack. Right? So uh, excellent. So as, as folks can see different people in different areas of the stack, so it's gonna be a very interesting and lively conversation. Um, okay, so maybe let's start with the most basic question, right? So when I, I remember every time like something big comes up, like a big trend comes up, like for example, when Hadoop and big data came up or even when cloud came up, you know, I never could really pin down what big data meant or what cloud meant. There'd be people with, you know, you know like a, a 10 gigs or 100 gigs of data, and there'd be people with 100 petabytes or exabytes of data saying the same thing, it's big data, right? So, and similarly with the cloud. So what is cloud native to each of you and each of your 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 areas that you represent, right? Like uh, maybe we'll go with the same order. So Abby, maybe you want to kick it off. I, I feel like cloud native is like the Rorschach test for whom you're talking to. Like, what does it mean to you? And then you can kind of go from there because it kind of, when it first came on the scene, when people started using it, I, I, I kind of closely aligned it to, oh, so you're talking about 12 factor apps. We're just rebranding what we're talking about stateless applications. But obviously since then it has morphed into so many other things. And so it's, it no longer just really applies to stateless applications, but the way that I think about it is writing applications or using infrastructure in ways that apply to all of the all of the gains we thought we were going to get out of the cloud. And I say we thought because I feel like it was part of the early mythos of cloud in 2007, 2008, when cloud came on, it was going to solve all of our problems. It was going to be highly resilient, scalable, secure. You know, you were never going to have to worry about failure. You, you could burst into the cloud at any moment. It was just going to, it was just going to be amazing. And I feel like obviously the cloud didn't solve those problems for, for many more years, but I feel like when we, when we started talking about architecting our applications in cloud native ways, and we started having a rise of these cloud native technologies that are rewriting the underlying infrastructure, that really started to change it where we actually could have those things. We could have highly resilient applications that were scalable. We could start to think more meaningful about ephemeral applications and really take advantage of that. So when I think about cloud native, I think about the intentionality behind that versus a specific technology or a frame. But... Awesome, awesome, great. Thanks, Abby. Um, JJ? Yeah, I mean, along the same lines, I mean, that the, 
uh, so if you go about uh, with the developer experience uh, and the weight weight which changed from building client server applications to basically being able to deploy at a frequency that you've been used to deploying uh, and then slowly the frequency got uh, shorter with the, and then the structure got built with three tier applications and then it, that was okay too uh, and then uh, and that speed wasn't enough either uh, so then the next generation of like how you basically build deploy the speed at which you'd have to build deploy uh, and manage applications have been like now uh, transformed into a next stage uh, and it's the same thing that abby said in terms of the intentionality of how you think about uh, think about the experience uh, into an experience of like what may, what matters and how it changes uh, and every time you'd have to have a moniker or a name for the thing uh, because it's like one one step function change over like everything that's ha already happened so the name for what's happening right now in terms of an end to end experience like uh, there are multiple names from devsecops to cloud native they all mean this similar intent uh, as an application developer you don't care how it's called you just can develop and de deploy and distribute faster and as a application person who's operating the infrastructure you don't care you get much more le much level a different level of visibility and a different level of controls that you can actually apply uh, but it uh, obviously it needs a name that you can you can hang your uh, stuff on top of and then uh, uh, that to me is cloud native. Like you can develop things faster, you can deploy things faster, you can debug things faster uh, than you've ever known, uh, and you can uh, roll back things faster before uh, you can ever do. Right. Yeah, so that, that makes yeah that makes complete. I think uh, it's also interesting to put in perspective. I think at least my perspective. I don't know if other folks have different opinions, but you know, like five years ago, ten years ago, when you had to get an application or whatever it is deployed, right? you'd have to start all the way from racking and stacking machines. And so you order machines and then like, you know, people say, okay, come back in six months or one year and we'll get you the machines, right? And so, okay, you're off six months or one year building your application and the end-to-end -end experience and all of that and even more and then taking vacation, everything, you're back nine months later and now you can roll it out, right? And then you want to scale it and now you want try thrice the number of machines. Okay, come back in nine months again. And so now you have all the time to do whatever it is, but you know, today those nine months and vacation, all of that is cut and now it's just a few minutes, right? So. <laughs> it's really changed, but but anyways, yeah. Tanmay, I would love to hear your point of view. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah. I mean, like you know, what what Abby and, and DJ said like resonates a lot to me. One of the lenses I've also increasingly been thinking about is um, the uh, overall kind of the journey from cloud, cloud native, etc. Right. It was kind of a journey of like um, increasing productivity, right, and and being able to justify that increase in productivity, right? Like, I, I feel like the last decade that we had was really kind of a decade of solving ops problems, right? It was saying that, you know, there's cloud, but operating in the cloud, we need to figure out how to do ops on the cloud well. And when we started doing ops on the cloud well, um, you know, that, that, that started moving towards cloud native, right? So now kind of when things start becoming truly cloud native, that discussion, for me is now firmly around productivity, right? And it's like, it's like, you know, we, we, we forget about the ops, right? Cloud native, it, a thing for me, if it's truly cloud native is to like, you, can you forget about the ops and only focus on productivity, right? Um, and by forget about the ops, it usually means that can ops itself become a part of your infrastructure in a sense, right? Like all of those concerns that you have with ops, like can it be something that you just pay a thing for as you use it, right? Uh, but but your your team is not concerned with it, right? Like we are only kind of focusing on productivity. So I feel like that that this decade especially, right, is going to be like this time when we think we, we shift our focus from thinking about ops to shift our focus of, to thinking about productivity, right? Or enabling that rather, right? And 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 make ops a thing that just happens, right? Uh, and and more productivity. So that that is kind of uh, uh, you know increasingly one of the ways that I've been thinking about uh, cloud native. But but interesting. I, I'm gonna like follow up with a, another question for you specifically, Tanmay, because you are uh, in the business of simplifying app development, right? Not just app right. development. So how do you think about right. app from the cloud native perspective? Yeah, I think I think in the I think the ecosystem that we're in today, from an application development point of view, right? I think like compute for like if you're building modern applications today, right? And 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 for me, it was like I mean I'm. I'm I'm quote unquote born on the cloud, right? So I haven't seen 
like i mean sure i have and work with kind of racks and stuff like that but like really professionally everything started happening on the cloud right so uh, from from kind of from from the point of view of like wearing an application developers hat thinking about um the problems and the challenges today right it's like i think compute is is easy right i mean quote unquote like compute i think is is easy right so that's nice um uh and uh and and ci cd was a big thing right uh that's becoming easier that's becoming a thing that we talk about that that's a huge thing right and the the productivity also around ci cd is there is massive conversations for developers around it right which is that every time there's a pull request i want that ci cd to happen and i want a version of my application right we talk about gitops we talk about infrastructure as code we talk about all of these things but but the ultimate idea for a developer is to say every time i make a commit can i see a version of my application right and and i can test it qa it use it right whatever it is um and so so compute was easy compute scales out as well there's low ops right there's this piece around ci cd lots of tooling lots of improvements lots of vendors right so that's gotten that that's improved massively databases themselves have also kind of gone through a massive evolution over the last few years right and that's been amazing for developers too uh now the piece that still remains a challenge for application developers is like cool but using that data right in an application context that still has operational challenges that has still has like ops challenges that still has security challenges that still has scaling challenges right like that's a piece that that people struggle with because that piece requires operational expertise it's not application expertise right so so that piece around kind of data access that really merges those two together right we see that as a as a big problem right where that needs to be solved especially as people start to use better and better data systems right that scale that handle their kind of workloads better people start choosing application and api stacks that make it better for them to deliver their applications right uh, this piece in the middle uh is important to kind of unlock the cloud native work that's happening on either end of the data end of the app end right so that's kind of where uh, we we see a tremendous amount of um, like friction for developers and an opportunity to kind of systematically address that once and for all got it makes sense that's awesome yeah that's a, that, that was that was quite interesting and i'm sure uh, all of the others also like i'd be curious to hear like uh, for your own projects right maybe reverse order like jj and abby where you see your particular projects meet cloud native right? like so uh, uh, tanmay was talking about the dev side and how we, how he simply or how the project that he's looking at with uh, you know hasura is simplifying that access layer of data right so similarly and and how it simplifies things in the cloud native context right like so if you think about cloud native in general it is accelerating everything faster deploys faster everything but when you look at your particular projects right how does that meet cloud native right like how do you see that evolve and how do you see that helping maybe jj you want to go you're on mute by the way <clears throat> okay uh, need to get used to the mute and mute thing so no it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting question because uh, uh, it's sort of like now you have to weed through the noise to figure out like what exactly do we provide as a value uh, to uh, to users is like Uh, it's more of a harder problem than actually saying what value it provides so uh, i mean one uh, one example uh, thing like uh, what uh, tanmay was saying in terms of uh, the speed at which you are going to be basically be developing applications and the reliability that it actually demands in terms of what the application requires <laughs> is a is a here and now problem right so earlier most of the applications that were developed were back office applications uh, to a large extent uh, uh, they put they put a um, out for maintenance come come back in two days kind of thing was a normal thing uh, not too far not too long ago right so that was like the way where people upgraded uh, infrastructure upgraded applications and stuff and now uh, uh, oh, it was interesting like the last amazon outage uh took down a radio station which was i think it's 1908 or something like that like it it was started in 1908 so a radio station that's like so traditional uh relies uh on modern infrastructure to be always available and always online uh, for an end customer that actually 
uh, is is much more real and much more now. Uh, so the piece of infrastructure that we work on is essentially just to uh, help, regardless of like Amazon going down, trying to make sure your, your availability is high in, term, uh, in keeping it up and running. Uh, and especially the more you make uh, distributed data become, uh, transactional distributed data become more real, people are just going to store it and expect it to be available all the time. And uh, it needs to be available, uh, services needs to be available, data needs to be served. Uh, so that becomes much more of an important problem to solve in the stack of what uh, what we are talking about in cloud native stack. So that is the piece where trying to keep uh, applications be connected and routing traffic, uh, delivering application traffic to the right location. So your availability is always uh, guaranteed. So your SLAs for your end users are kept up to date. Uh, that is where our stack uh, comes in, uh, comes to help. Uh, and this is like, you took care of provisioning of infrastructure, which is like the hardest problem, which you know, uh, Abby deals with it probably <laughs> mostly. And then, uh, and then building applications that actually are, is faster, quicker, modern, uh, and then uh, in the same and the same breath, trying to deploy something uh, into production and being able to serve the traffic uh, is what I think um, we do. We take care of. Awesome. awesome. And Abby, do you want to? Talk about uh, topic. Sure, and I'm big fans of what Tetrate's up to these days as well. I do think we haven't fully uncovered the opportunity that exists with Service Mesh. I think we're just on the cusp, but it's a pretty early technology too. Um, Puppet's a little bit a layer below in that where we continue to be focused on really where we started, which is automating the infrastructure underneath everything and making sure that it's available, resilient, and at the end of the day, you know what you have and where you have it, and you, it's where you expect it to be. Um, as we look towards the future around cloud native, we really, we've been thinking a lot about how do we extend the value of desired state to the cloud? Because just because you're moving to cloud native stacks and you're looking at writing more and more cloud native applications, but it doesn't mean you don't need to understand who has access to what, when they have it, is it compliant? Is it is it configured the way that I think it's supposed to be configured? And is it accessible to developers in a way that they can actually easily use their environments and collaborate across teams? And so we've, we've had a, a strong focus on addressing that space, both with a event-driven workflow automation that's focused on cloud native but also extending the value prop around desired state into the cloud. And, you know, it's it's not without its, its complications, of course, because when we talk about cloud, cloud native, and, and JJ even talking about service mesh and touch rate, like a lot of these technologies are still pretty nascent. nascent yeah. I mean, Kubernetes is only, what, seven years old now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Service mesh, what, four? Four, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Envoy, I'm trying to think back when I first saw the, the first Prezo on, on Service Mesh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that was about four years ago in Envoy. And, you know, and I just think it's, it's, I, it's one hand, it's the most exciting time to be in infrastructure, enterprise infrastructure in the space we're in because it's changing so quickly and it's being reinvented. But on the other hand, it's also really hard to predict how this is actually going to play out when we start to see real workloads at real scale. Yeah. leverage these technologies like okay what does it look like at a hundred thousand you know applications and what does it look like at a million spread across a distributed environment and distributed state and the ex you know and you talked a lot about stateful expectations and data and where's my data and like what if that's changing all the time and you start to apply data sovereignty requirements and um acts you know accessibility requirements and all of a sudden you know i think it gets more and more complex and i also think that that breeds a stronger need for products like service mesh, right? Like, where do you get it? How do you get to it? What's the fastest path? And the fastest path isn't always going to be the same path. Impact, yeah. So I, I think it's I think it's super interesting from a puppet standpoint. Obviously, I get I, I'm hyper focused on the infrastructure layer below and automating that. But I am super excited about a lot of the work that's happening as we move up the stack and and really rebuilding what's going to be the future of of the underlying infrastructure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. So uh, maybe um, 
we re never really got into the, uh, we talked about what your various projects do, right? All of you guys are open source, so that makes it easy, right? But I think what would be interesting is rather than what does your project do, what is a canonical example of how a user would use your project, right? So that, like, this is not the lens of the capability, this is more the lens of usage, right? Like, as an example, right? Like, as a distributed SQL database, we help, you know, do resilient scale, yada, 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 some stuff, right? But the type of like the type of usage that a user would do is like uh, if they want to build an application and now their application is starting to get important, critical. It needs to be a lot of users depend on it, and so it needs to be up all the time. And you know, in the cloud, you can have failures, and you don't want to let those failures affect you, right? So, so we help with that. And then the application starts getting more and more popular. A lot of users come and use it, and now we help you scale the database as you need it, right? And so. Now the application got really popular. Now you want to move over to a different geography and open it up in an adjacent country. And that country says, you know what, you can't take my data out to a different location. We help with that, right? So, so can you talk about that lens, like a very simplistic view of, you know, a canonical usage view of your various stacks? That that would help also, I think, all the listeners and, and including myself, right? Like internalize exactly what this piece of the stack does, right? And, and how, what are the various things that it, like you guys are facing and looking at and so on, right? So uh, maybe we start with you, Abby, and we can go bottom up uh, in terms of the stack. <clears throat> well, I'd say the simplest use case is, what do I have in my environment and what does it look like? And is it is it the way that I think it should be? You know, when we talk about desired state or even infrastructure as code, it's really about what does my environment look like? Is it, how is how is it configured? And can I access it in the way that I need to access it? And even when I think about the work we've been doing around compliance, compliance is just an extension of desired state. Does my environment look like the way that it's supposed to? And if it doesn't, why not? Now, I do think that, you know, this, these use cases get more and more prevalent as the environments get more, more complex. And then as you start to have more compliance and security concerns, uh, where my environment sits, what, what OSs am I running? Where am I running those OSs? What are they up to date? Are they not up to date? What am I gonna do about those that aren't up to date? And I think it's those, those use cases that I actually spend a lot of time thinking about because how do you make that easier? Because if I'm, you know, we talked a little bit about ops. I've, I, I, I've spent most of my time in operations. And so when I think about as an operator, what do I care about? It's how easy is that to manage? You know, because my, my work is now harder. Can I do that in a way that's intelligible and scalable? because now my estate is broad. I, I, you know, when I first started my career, Kardec, I really resonated with the servers and downtime and I put up many outage windows when we had to re-rack servers and, and run new cables. Um, and, and when I thought about the, God, we didn't know how lucky we had it back then. You know, you basically, how many servers do you have? I have like 12 and I have like three apps. You know, we didn't know how good we had it. It was like simple, it was so easy, right? And now it's like, yeah, I don't know how many servers I have. I have a lot. And it's, and, and so I think when you think about the simplicity of having a single data center or a single row of racks and you're like, oh, here's my stuff. I got it. It's all right here. And now it's, you know, if I'm an operator, it's everywhere. Where is your stuff? Well, I don't know. It's some of it's an AWS E, some of it's in Azure, some of it's in GCP. I've got two data centers and one colo. And all of a sudden, my job of like three people of managing all of this is super complicated. And now I'm also having to keep up to date with the latest cloud native technology and what's going on in open source and what are my tools doing? And, oh, I have to actually be compliant. And I just feel like the environment's getting more and more complex for the jobs that most of us started as. <laughs> and I don't know that the, the tooling and and the expectation have actually necessarily kept up with that, with those changes. But that's just my, my viewpoint. Awesome, interesting. Um, JJ, next layer of the stack, I guess. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think Abhi, Abhi nailed it in terms of uh, what the uh, what the expectation is, right? So, uh, I mean, fundamentally, like what uh, what uh, I, I'd probably be dating again myself uh, in terms of like three tier apps. At, uh, we all are, man. Only Parme is getting out of this. <laughs> <Ten servers. laughs> Lamp stack is coming back, JJ. It's coming back. Just you wait. <laughs> yeah, somebody <else>. oh. <laughs> yeah, so the uh, so 
fundamentally the systems have changed from being a very prescriptive system where like you had uh, things that are very well defined you exactly knew like five apps that's running with five endpoints that uh, everybody knew whether you put it on a dock or some place like you exactly know like the ip addresses that it was serving and everything so it was good life life was good uh, it was easily comprehensible and now with all the scale and everything and the need need uh, need for it uh, systems have gotten very complex but the expectation and the simplicity of like i want to know everything that's actually running in my data center still exists with people's mind so the system have become more descriptive and uh, to abhi's point like all the tooling needs to basically evolve to make it as simple as it was before when we had the when we had it good that's what we needed it now as well so uh, so i think i think a lot of things about even in service mesh is like okay you created a full on descriptive system now let me figure out all your services and then surface it as a full on service discovery solution so you got all the services we exactly know where you're running these services and uh, by the way when you're running these services i can basically help you say how do you segment these services so that you can actually have a security boundary for some of your critical pci compliant data for example or like same thing like what you said geographically uh, distributed uh, services being able to access some information so uh, so because you are in the network path and access layer so you can put uh, segmentation in a completely different form than the one that you had used to before uh, so those are like basic use cases that people look at like i mean like give me the same simplicity that i'm used to uh, but with the complexity that we have and the scale at which we are running uh, which boils down to like list all list all my services protect all my services and create boundaries for my services same same old problem with much more complexity that's it so makes sense great awesome and tanmay i think like the and, and it's kind of like a nice uh layer of the stack above right which is that when we think about cloud native developers right and they're kind of building applications what what they want right and they they're kind of writing applications that are stateless right so they want it to be stateless um you know things like serverless functions for example force you to be stateless whether you want it or not right um by by taking away a lot of kind of stateful power from the developer right so so when they kind of think about interacting with data it's a challenge for them because all data interaction has has historically been stateful right, right? and that's a royal pain in all of the body parts they can imagine right for this for for working with data and for building applications right um you can you'll have this issue just starting off with fundamentals of like you know it's a tcp connection right most data systems even if it's an event system right um it's over tcp right you're interacting with databases over tcp you want to look at optimizing your actions and connections with the database it's over tcp right like that that itself kind of breaks a lot of the guarantees the models the way they think about it right uh, the way they think about building applications right um and and so kind of where we come in is to say you know when to to enable these application developers right can we can we separate out some of the data ish logic and the application logic and create an interface that is entirely over http and json for these application developers right like so so can they interact with their data systems which is read you know write slash transact Uh, subscribe and notify right like pull events or pull changes and notify which is get notified of changes can i get these four interactions right that i need with my domain data over http and json right like that's the problem that hasra solves right um and operationally right and and it kind of gives developers that so they like i i can use my favorite database my favorite data system um and i get this uh, http and json api my life is easy right my life is sorted it all works right so that that kind of is where operationally has sort of fits in the other challenge uh, for again application developers again in this cloud native landscape right is that it's very um, and and to kind of a little bit to what abi and jj were saying before right it's like we've moved to this world where we can't choose a central stack for people anymore everybody is just going to do whatever right and people are going to do what is best for them for those users right um if you folks are familiar with the javascript ecosystem right you feel like there's a new javascript framework every week right and you're like what is happening right and 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 i i i get very excited about that because because it's a sign of maturity of the ecosystem right it's like everybody like there's a javascript framework for everything you have a static website you have an e-commerce site 
right? I got to interrupt uh, and say one thing here. I don't know if I'm dating myself, dude, but hey, what's up with that new ecosystem every two two years or whatever, man? Like, every, I have to keep learning JavaScript. How many times over? I have no idea. <laughs> it's insane, right? And JavaScript itself keeps changing. I mean, it's the most it's the most fascinating ecosystem. Like, I love that ecosystem so much because it it, it it's democrat. Like, it's like millions of developers at the same time. Like like upskilling and learning like different ways of building applications right and it's it's just an amazing ecosystem right um and and i think like and i think that's a sign of the maturity of kind of this software engineering right like you don't have the same chair in every room right at least they should rename it every time now they stop to then it's like new or is it old like but anyways i joke keep going <laughs> yeah no but but i think and i think that's what kind of awesome right but one of the challenges that organizations face when when their developers are choosing their favorite framework of the month right um, or or their favorite framework of the year or whatever the the uh, there, there is there is an upskilling challenge and there is a security challenge right which is that like if they're going to just do whatever how are we going to ensure best practices around security around like how they write code right and 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 stuff like that so so this piece around data access becomes a really nice point because you can say that i can operationally de risk what the application developers do and give them full freedom to go and just build stuff and you know it's it's http it's json do whatever it, operationally we're fine right um and and second is a security aspect which is to say that if that data interaction is secure like authorization is built in um then you know developers are again kind of free to do whatever you deploy it at the edge you deploy it in a different vpc you deploy it in a cloud you deploy it as a serverless function right that also kind of like that governance security authorization aspect also uh, you know gets centralized right so you you you're not worried about letting developers just do stuff um and and you know that kind of goes towards one step of what we all want which is everybody being able to get more cloud native right so so that's kind of where has dropped it in right that ops and security de risk uh, for application developers when they when they talk to data so that uh, that that's the piece that that we're kind of trying to find to solve awesome that's awesome i think uh, personally for me one thing that's fascinating to see right in all of the cloud native stacks including gigabyte is that you know now security is starting to become a mainstream piece of it everywhere like so everyone's thinking about it as a first class whereas yep. i mean i don't know again dating myself like you know 10 years ago or something it would be like let's get everything done and then now let's think about security and is it secure yeah maybe 10 years yep. ago that yep. i wasn't even there like 10 years ago i, I mean maybe 3 4 yeah like... maybe that maybe that you're right actually <laughs> you're right so maybe we aren't dating ourselves that's fine yeah <laughs> so um Okay so I think uh, like um interesting thing right we talked about open source and we talked about cloud native right but we talked about them independently right I think um it would be interesting to get all of your thoughts I mean you're all we are we are all actually including myself like you know uh, behind open source projects and behind the cloud native trend right how do you folks see those two interacting like that's a uh, question one and uh question two is uh, you know the, there's often a, a lot of thought about you know is it safe to open source some other big cloud provider will take it and run it and and yet none of us have really heeded that so too late for that but what are your thoughts about it, right so um so yeah two part question open source and cloud native and open source and cloud providers right? so that's a two part question uh maybe we start with you jj uh, thank you why me <laughs> but <laughs> you you're always in the middle right so irrespective of the direction of the stack so maybe jj jj is going to take this for the team basically right, right. it's like this is the <laughs> He's going to lay down some real topic. You should exactly. yeah, it's a highly politicalized one. You should lean into the drama and the politics around it, JJ, and just exactly. like lean into that. <laughs> Say um, the most <laughs> controversial thing possible. There we go. We'll back you up. <laughs> so, uh um I mean, I think uh uh I don't think there is much of a uh uh i mean you can squint your eyes and connect open source to cloud native uh, but open source existed for a really long time before cloud native was a thing right so open source is more of a uh, more of a movement for uh, what uh, what uh, what developers demanded uh, they wanted out of the thing and it also to a large extent I, at least my feel is like it speaks to the speed at which we'd have to innovate uh, for uh, for meeting the needs of uh end users and businesses and all the advancements that's happening whether it's like medical research or like whatever like whatever advancements that are happening to like hosting a radio station on amazon so it doesn't matter what it is uh 
yeah, technology had to catch up and the best way for technology to catch up was the open source as an ecosystem being there. And cloud native is mostly like a tag along at the end of it to basically say like, okay, I got open source, I got cloud native. So I know I'm not being like politically correct in this stuff anyway, but uh, but that's sort of how I feel uh, uh, cloud native uh, in the whole, uh, whole ecosystem. But the <clears throat> other question that you asked is like much more, has much more gravity to what it means in terms of uh, cloud providers it's uh, versus, uh, open source. Um, I mean, I don't think. Uh, again, it's it's uh, it's more related to like uh, fundamentally. It's more related to uh, striking a very fragile balance between grace and greed. Uh, in some ways, like you don't have to commercialize your business no matter what. And commercialization is capitalism at the core of it. Like you just want to cannibalize anything that's possible to make the money. Uh, and the same thing goes for cloud providers. Cloud providers cannibalize uh, uh, smaller vendors to uh, on on top of open source. So, uh, but at the core of it, like striking that fragile bal fragile balance between uh, grace and greed in terms of like being fully open to how you commercialize is uh, it's going to be a constant struggle. So if you innovate. The way, I mean, at least for us, like if we innovate the way uh, cloud providers innovate with the fundamentals that they have for innovation, uh, then it's a lost cause by my test will give in. Uh, so uh, that's where I think the change or shift in, uh, uh, shift in uh, mindset happens uh, with respect to like where you innovate using open source, because open source is open source. But where, where on the open source you innovate is, uh, is a question that uh, I think, like if you're going to host, they're going to host better than you can host at the end of the day. Uh, it's not a winning proposition, uh, but uh, there are areas where you can actually uh, innovate in a, a way where it actually uh, shifts uh, some of the fundamentals based off of uh, where you innovate versus what uh, what they're capable of. Right? So at least to me, that's where uh, we put the focus on uh, and then uh, we try and create the balance um, in terms of trying to make sure uh, where cloud providers cannibalize open source versus uh, open source and cloud native uh, as a thing. I don't know. I uh, I sort of like deconstructed your question in a different way too. No, no, that's fine. Answer, that's but... I think uh, your uh, grace versus greed, like I, 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 I use the phrase short-term, long-term greed versus short-term greed. I mean, it's just a different uh, phrasing of the same I think, uh, thing that you said. Yeah. But I think the fundamental question, so you you believe that open source will exist as a trend outside of cloud native, managed, all of that stuff. <clears throat> That's 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 the belief overall, which is why cloud native, which is why open source should exist. And your point is, it's a it's a dance between the the two sides, right? Like you know, like the open value side and the commercial side, you know, which drives even further future values. It's a dance between that. That's really how you would phrase it. Correct. Correct. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Um, maybe uh, to you, Tanmay. I I I really I I really like the way DJ kind of articulated that. I think the the way I think about it on on two aspects, like which is the importance of open source for for uh, developers, right? Like, what is it really important for today? Like, wh why why do I even care about something being open source versus it being uh, like a vendor, like a SaaS solution, right? Um, the the for 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 a, for a for a newer generation of software developers, right? I think the I think when they think about open source, what they really want is community. Right, and what they're really worried about when they're kind of building applications, right, is especially as it starts to become more and more mission critical, is their ability to like their their the, the risk of lock-in, right? Like, will I get locked in? And the problem, you know, that, that's and, and the lock-in is not just like a vendor lock-in, but the lock-in is also lock-in like you know what happens if I can't do something? What happens if I need to move off for some reason, right? Um, what if I can't do something? What if I can't find like there's no skill set around it, right? And so open source kind of helps people articulate or like represent a lot of those concerns and say, there is a community around this and the community will, will help us move forward. Because I'm a part of this community, the community will ensure that we don't get locked in. The community will ensure that there's migration into and migration out of. The community will ensure that there is upskilling, there is tutorials, there is learning around this piece of technology, right? So, so open source is kind of important to developers from a community point of view um, uh, is, is, is kind of, you know, 
I think maybe a relatively newer dimension in some in, in in some senses, which is you know, which has a business impact also to people using open source technologies. Uh, I think as vendors or creators of open source technology, especially vis-a-vis uh, cloud vendors, right? It's it sucks to not be a cloud vendor and deliver things and have and be in a place where the tech that you have can be run by a cloud vendor, right? Uh, but I think it's interesting because. There are kind of uh, some. There are, I think, two dimensions of opportunity. The first dimension is that it's state the, um, if, if especially if like the thing that you're making um, available as a service to folks is stateful, right? Um, there is a lot of kind of proprietary work that is not related so much to lock-in or is not developer-facing or engineer-facing, but is an operational concern that allows vendors to kind of add value. Right to say that I will add operational value for this stateful distributed workload, and and then host that on a commoditized cloud kind of compute layer, network layer, and storage layer, right? Or a commoditized Kubernetes layer now, right? Um, so so that kind of allows an opportunity to say you can still have IP, that IP can still be ops heavy, that IP is still something that cloud vendors can't take, and that IP is still something that fits in with the value of open source because developers want the same API. Right, they they it's okay if it's ops black magic, and I see a really good example of that is things like you know what's happening with the database ecosystem, right? Things like Aurora and like what you know you folks are doing in Yugabyte and stuff, where developers are like it speaks Postgres, so that means I have Postgres open source, I have RDS, I have Aurora, I have Yugabyte, I have whatever. Um, it works, right? It's nice. And developers don't care how it's done underneath, right? Because they know that they can migrate into and out of because that API is standardized. The other dimension I think for open source vendors is also around workflows. Um, and that's also kind of what we're seeing in some of some some more recent open source companies, especially the, those that are built around frameworks, um, where workflows can add a lot of value, right? And workflows um, and and having proprietary workflows or automated workflows for teams and collaboration is is becoming really important as as software engineering scales to a larger number of people. Um, and so that also unlocks opportunities, which is you know something that a cloud vendor can't do because that collaboration and workflow and design process is is unique. To, to that technology and that community, right? So that those are kind of two dimensions, I think, where uh, you know it's it's not possible for cloud vendors to 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 really kind of come in. So that's those that's 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 some thoughts there. Awesome, awesome. And Abby, your thoughts on the on the same question? Oh, I have so many thoughts on open source. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to organize them. I'd say you know I, I'd say it's probably a blend of what both JJ and Tan may have said, but essentially. There's a lot of value in open sourcing something. Open sourcing, particularly what we've seen in, in the cloud native ecosystem, those technologies that should be standardized and really what we should build on top of should be open source. They should be allowed for everyone to be able to pull from, build on top of in the way they choose. Open source is also a great way to accelerate ecosystem engagement community. However, open sourcing for every pro for open sourcing something, there are also an equal, there's also equal negative or, you know, there's a downstream, which is I've open sourced my technology, which means anyone can use that. And yes, it's a great way to build community that's engaged around what I'm trying to do, but that community can choose to take it and take it a different direction. They can fork it, they can build a different product off of it. You know, once you've put something out in open source, you've now opened that door. And that's a door you can never close again. And, and I thought JJ had a good point is once something is out there and you've open sourced it, the onus is on you as a, the proprietary company that's trying to, to make money off of this product to innovate really, really quickly. Like you can't let your foot off the gas ever. And, and that's, you know, you have the, you know, JJ, you know, I'm gonna, JJ, I'm gonna use you as an example, but you have the, you know, you have the proprietary knowledge of how service mesh works and what it can do and the potential. And so you have the opportunity and that you have all of that knowledge. And so you can drive that innovation really, really quickly. But, you know, that onus is on you to continue that innovation journey. What's going to be better? What's going to be interesting? What's going to make this more relevant? And what's going to build value? Because the value proposition on top of an open source technology, that changes so quickly. What customers are willing to pay for that slice changes. I think it, having done this now through a few different companies, it changes faster than I think you even recognize how fast it changes. 
one second, the customer's like, great, this is worth my money. Here you go. And now, you know, the re- next, the first renewal, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe the open source is fine. Yeah. And so it's a, you know, it's a constant, you know, validation of the work you're doing from a proprietary standpoint that, that really differentiates you. So I think there's a ton of power in open source, but the, you know, it really does ask a lot of, of those of us that are trying to build businesses on top of that open source to really be as innovative as possible in a, on a constant basis. And I do think, I know hyperscale cloud providers taking open source is, is very much a hot topic. And a lot of times companies resort to changing licensing to address some of those concerns. And, and that is a way, but I think honestly, if you continue to drive innovation, you know, it, you continue to differentiate yourself as a product and differentiate the work you're doing. And I think that's where, you know, for those of us that are doing this work, we have to just focus on that versus worrying, is this going to be absorbed into another technology or another product? Awesome. That's great. I think uh, great, great points of view, great points of view across the, across the board. I think we may be closing in on our time. So um, let's do one more, um, you know, uh, round and then we can, we can close it off. Right. Um, one of the one of the hard problems, right, that we've found, at least we've come across with uh, users <clears throat> in this cloud native journey, is the um, cultural aspect and the skills required and the and the way to think about things, right? It changes quite a bit, right? Traditionally, you were doing something, now you need to be doing something else, right? And the something else can be, you know, as you mentioned, Abby, like the fifteen thousand open source projects you have to track and learn and do. That could be that aspect. It could just be a different approach to doing the same thing you were doing before, which looks unnecessarily complicated at a small scale, but is really needed as the scale hits you, right? Like, so uh, you're, you, I would love to hear your thoughts on what you're seeing with your communities, with your users on the, the cultural and mental shift into cloud native, right? Like, uh, whether it be with respect to skills and how you have to upskill, or whether it be with respect to technologies and how you have to change it or any of that stuff, right? So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, maybe we do, um, uh, like, you know, Kanmai, why don't you go first? Yeah, I, I think, I think that's a, um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, interesting things there to unpack because I feel like a lot of the folks are kind of struggling with, uh, a lot of kind of, uh, architects teams, platform teams within larger companies, right? They're kind of really thinking about how do we upskill people to really start thinking cloud native, right? What is our technology stack that is standard? What is a technology stack that is specific at all layers of the stack, right? Uh, do we all have the same cloud vendor even, right? Do we all use the same flavor of Kubernetes, right? Uh, do we all use a service mesh, right? Like, do we all use the same database? Do we all use different databases, right? Do we have a fixed set of databases, right? Like, it's, it's, it's very hard to understand what is specific, what is generic. It's very hard to understand what we should enforce and what we should kind of allow teams to choose and then work backwards from that to think about how upskilling should happen, right? Or what an appropriate upskilling plan should be because that's kind of really at the heart of all of this, right? So I think from from from, from our point of view, what we've seen is that we, we, we really kind of, we've really seen a lot of success with teams that have started thinking about uh, trying to make their teams as independent as possible in, in making certain decisions, right? While with given certain constraints. Um, but, but, but I, I'd love to, and, 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 you know, this is especially worked for folks where in this, uh, you're working on a new stack, it's relatively greenfield where some aspect of it is greenfield on brownfield, right? Those kinds of areas, it works well, but I'd love to hear from you folks and what you've seen as you know, approaches that people have taken, uh, in, in, in thinking about this kind of upskilling challenge. All right. Um, Abby, maybe we go to you next since JJ was complaining, we put him on the spot last time. Okay. <laughs> I will go. Uh, I, I think skills, I think the skills is a huge challenge. I mean, this is a, a framework that didn't really exist a few years ago. And so there's, you know, you know, I heard a couple of years ago that someone was going to go out and hire a bunch of cloud native and Kubernetes experts. And I was like, really, where are you going to find them? Because there's not that many of them. You know, the number of people that have run cloud native at scale is a very small number of people anyways. And so I think reskilling, upskilling to Tan Mai's point is, is the path forward. I think that's tricky because you're putting the onus on developers, operators, engineers to really have the time to balance their current day job with learning the new skills. But I think it's absolutely necessary to give them the chance to both 
have the learning, the training, but then give them the space to learn on the job and grow into that because you're, you know, the people that can do this work is, aren't out there. There aren't more. And so it's really going to be about growing the base that we have. But I also think that coupled with that is why we've seen a rise in usage of low code, no code too. And why we're starting to see how can we simplify that experience? So, um, I, I just think that both of those things have to happen in tandem to JJ, you said this earlier too, simplifying the experience, simplifying how we use these and operate these tools while also giving engineers the skills they need to actually take advantage of, of what these technologies can actually do. Great. Yeah. Go for it. JJ, your thoughts. Yeah, I know we are up against time. Like I'll try to keep it, uh, keep it short. Uh, uh, I mean, like, a perfect analogy or like a way of thinking about this is like uh, it's a complete uh, uh, this is a huge topic by the way i mean like i, I can go on like six episode and then i'll still not be done with the culture change you heard uh, that you're doing episode two at some point anyways <laughs> so, there's a podcast but, uh, coming right <laughs> podcast. but but because uh, i've been like uh so i've been fascinated with this for like over like eight, six seven years in terms of trying to do this stuff but uh so uh so the a way to think about it is like uh, it's a shift a shift between shift from uh, hunting behavior to farming so you're going to basically take a bunch of hunters and put it, put them on a farmland to basically make sure like okay now figure out how you're going to eat your food and everything needs to shift in terms of how you collaborate how you work together uh, how you manufacture food and all the things and how you get food on the plate everything changes and the mindset that's needed, the skilling that's needed to basically get into that zone is like uh, that. I mean, I would say like, that's kind of the shift that we are in right now to get, get us into a zone where I think uh, it'll be productive. So that's why a bunch of these tooling kind of will help uh, in terms of trying to make sure like uh, people can do that. We do like this training certifications, all the things that are needed. Uh, so a lot of things need to change. That's what I mean. Like, okay, so I'll keep it, keep it short. So, I love that analogy so much. I'm totally stealing that analogy. That is amazing. (laughs) Yeah, likewise. Actually, likewise. Uh, I I thought the Kubernetes uh, pets to cattle was interesting. This is the other side of getting to cattle. You come from the hunting side to cattle. (laughs) Awesome. 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 Fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, this this has been a fun discussion, guys. I think there's a a lot of other discussion topics that are interesting, like JJ said, like uh, some of these topics we could talk about for quite a bit of time. But, uh, you know, I think we're, we're up for time um anyways thank you thank you all for joining uh you know joining me here on this um you know fireside chat this uh, discussion was pretty lively pretty fun hitting on pretty real topics at least for me so uh it's been awesome thank you folks thank you thank for you. having me yeah thank you for having me it was a great panel thank you Bye. yeah